How Britain's Electric Car Revolution Took a Wrong Turn This is part one of a film about the extraordinary story of how, after decades of success, the UK risks losing its car industry to more muscular rivals. And please subscribe and turn the bell on to watch part two. When Margaret Thatcher opened Britain's first Nissan plant in 1986, it was a new dawn for the British car industry. The factory was confirmation from Nissan after a long and thorough appraisal that within the whole of Europe, the United Kingdom was the most attractive country, politically and economically, for large-scale investment and offered the greatest potential, said Thatcher in a speech officially opening the plant. After a years-long courtship, she had persuaded the company to set up a manufacturing hub in Sunderland, in a major political coup that revitalized the domestic industry. Now car makers are going. UK production of cars has tumbled from 1.7 millions per year to just 866,000 this year, according to figures from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. British Volt, an electric car battery startup once hailed by Boris Johnson as the leading force in the battle to remain relevant, came to the brink of going bust last month after struggling to raise cash. The malaise is a product of political uncertainty, the legacy of the COVID pandemic and lingering microchip shortages. A looming recession is now set to test the industry to the core. As the electric car revolution dawns, Britain's vehicle manufacturers are on track to return to the doldrums of the 1970s rather than seizing the opportunities in front of them. So where did it all go wrong? With a government-imposed ban on the sale of petrol and diesel cars to to take effect in 2030, there is precious little time left for the industry to not only reverse its decline, but also reinvent itself for the battery-powered era. A report by the Faraday Institution, which was set up to monitor progress towards this goal, warned this summer that while the UK had so far sent positive signals to investors, more needs to be done, and quickly. Failure will result in the country's once successful car-making industry being largely consigned to the scrap heap. That would leave Britain reliant on imports from other big producers such as China, the US and Europe, which have raced ahead with the help of big state subsidies. There is still time to reverse the trend. But to replace assembly lines centered around internal combustion engines and claim a stake in the future, Britain needs to build battery factories and fast. Batteries, because of their weight and high value, are expensive to transport, meaning they must be sourced locally. Almost every other part of the electric car supply chain will be built around so-called gigafactories that produce batteries, with manufacturers co-locating facilities to reduce costs. However, the sorry saga of British Fault illustrates how Britain's efforts to become a thriving hub for manufacturing electric vehicles have so far stalled. The startup's £3.8 can plan to build Britain's first gigafactory in Blyth, lauded by Johnson when he was Prime Minister, has been pushed to the brink by a funding crisis. A fortnight ago, it was on the verge of calling in the administrators. While British Vault had won praise from the government and been assigned £100 million in grant funding, the company had not yet reached the milestones required to unlock the public money. That left Executive Chairman Peter Rolton hammering the phones to save British Vault. He called 150 potential investors in just a day as the cash crunch hit, keeping a record of his progress in a notebook emblazoned with the words, keep going, never give up. Entreaties to Grant Shapps, the business secretary, were ignored, with his officials refusing to release a £30 million tranche early. Rolton couldn't even get a meeting with Shapps. It left hopes for a national battery champion, 3,000 jobs and the seeds of a homegrown success story suddenly looking shaky. And all for the sake of what was, to British fault, a rounding error in the government finances. By lunchtime, Rolton hoped he would get what he needed to save his business and keep its dream of building the UK's first battery gigafactory. Ultimately, the company secured a five-week lifeline. Governments around the world are jostling to secure gigafactories for their own car industries. But in interviews with The Telegraph, academics, business figures and politicians raised concerns that there is still a worrying lack of urgency in the UK. We're on the precipice and we're staring into the abyss.
says Andy Palmer, a seasoned executive who worked at Japanese car giant Nissan before running the luxury British car maker Aston Martin. It really is do or die. As many supporters point out, the UK's car industry has strong roots built on some of the most famous brands in the world. It gives the sector a strong platform to build on. The post-war government owned the steel industry and, in an effort to rescue the country's battered economy, it demanded that up to 75% of cars be made for export, leading to a boon for the industry and for British exports. Marks such as Mini, Land Rover, Austin, Triumph, Jaguar, Morris and MG became household names around the world. For a while, this allowed Britain to be at the cutting edge of car development. Our successes included novel inventions such as the Rover GA to one gas turbine powered car, the world's first. British car makers dominated the Le Mans 24 hour contest in the 1950s, with Jaguar and Aston Martin Motors winning six in 10 races. By the late 1970s, however, the industry was flagging plagued by strikes, poor production quality, and rising competition from Japan and Germany. After coming to power in 1979, Margaret Thatcher sought to put this right by forcing the existing national giant British Leyland to become more efficient and bringing in more competition from abroad. Hard-nosed Leyland boss Michael Edwards, known as the Poison Dwarf by employees, cut the workforce in half but still maintained 80 pieces of production, closing loss-making MG and forcing other brands to pay their own way. A major part of Thatcher's plan also involved attracting investment from Japanese manufacturer Nissan by pitching Britain as a business-friendly staging post for making cars that could be sold en masse to neighboring Europe. The government made the former RAF Useworth Aerodrome available for development as part of its deal in Sunderland. Thatcher also ensured Nissan was allowed to claim tax relief for plant machinery, a policy that was set to be phased out by Chancellor Nigel Lawson. Today Nissan's Sunderland plant is regarded as an undisputed success story, employing 6,700 people and producing 246,000 cars last year alone. The company vies with Jaguar Land Rover for the top spot in UK car production. Best of all, the wages are good. The average pay packet for a Nissan worker is about £46,000, compared to Sunderland's median salary of £28,100. Graham Miller, leader of Sunderland Council, says Nissan's operations are vital to Sunderland and to the Northeast. I will gently suggest they are to the whole of the UK economy, he says. The deal works because everybody gets what they need, Miller says. Nissan gets a skilled workforce and plant, Workers get better than average pay, and Britain gets a valuable source of exports. The most recent testament to this success is Nissan's decision to build a new gigafactory next door. This was the fruits of groundwork laid two and a half years before, according to Miller. We kept at it, he says. Right at the very end, the government came in with a little bit of money to get it across the line. Government help is a common theme in motor plant success stories. Lord Heseltine, a veteran cabinet minister under both Thatcher and John Major and a former president of the Board of Trade, says the interventions to woo Nissan 40 years ago ostensibly conflicted with Thatcherite free market policies, but that any government would have done that to secure an investment on that scale. These were huge investments with very well-paid jobs, he says. We had the sites that were available and we had the skilled workforce. And we saw an argument that as part of the single European market, we were the best place for the Japanese to base their investment. The government was deeply involved in the dialogue to bring big investment into the country. All governments do it, and it would be unforgivable if they didn't. With the tectonic plates of the automotive industry shifting once again, there are calls for ministers to take a similarly muscular approach in the new battle to ensure Britain is not left behind. This year, just 1 in 10 cars bought in the UK were made here. The proportion for electric car sales could be even slimmer based on our current trajectory. Car makers have faced a succession of challenges in recent years, each unprecedented and posing its own threat to the sector, according to Mike Hawes, chief executive of the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, 
SMMT. Unfortunately, the lack of investment caused by years of uncertainty about a Brexit deal, shutdowns forced by the coronavirus pandemic, the upcoming 2030 ban on the sale of new petrol and diesel cars, microchip supply chain shortages, and now the prospect of a two-year recession, forecast earlier this month by the Bank of England, are all extremely challenging. Britain is not alone in its fight to keep a buoyant motor industry in the face of growth from Japan and China. What do France, Italy and the US car output look like? What is the current development of European gigafactories? Well, stay tuned to find out.